So good afternoon, everyone. And thanks, Morgan. So my name is Eloisa Kellen, and I am the uh, Saskatchewan Provincial Plant Disease Specialist uh, since 2020. And before that, I was in Alberta with University of Alberta and Agricultural Agriculture Canada in Lacombe uh, for almost 10 years. And before that, I was also planned to follow this in different institutions for another 10 to 13 years. So, almost 25 years in the practice of um, anthropology. Some of this stuff uh, reminded me of the past. Like, my master's degree was impact of irrigation practices on the epidemics of incoming bacterial blood. And my doctorate, which was defended 2005 and 2017, I defended my doctorate degree at the University of Alberta on serial lymph diseases. But all, all talk today is on community. Uh, the uh, focus of talk today is on identification of community diseases. So the way I talk would be first talk about sclerotinia, then bring black leg to the picture, compare the two, then bring red cilium, compare the three. And after each disease I explain, I also will tell you what was seen last growing season across the province. I have 95 slides, but most of them are pictures, so don't worry. So again, as uh, Morgan, so, okay. I guess perhaps sometimes I show things to my parents. Yeah, that's fine. So again, uh, as Morgan urged <laughs> people to sign up for a provincial pest monitoring program. Provincial pest monitoring programs are 100% uh, permission based. Uh, doesn't matter if it's a declared pest or non-declared pest. So uh, we'll get to collaborate uh, quite the end of the talk, but everything is permission based. So if you want to have a strong position, especially when it comes to trade tables, like in terms of uh, uh, bacteria of pod rot of, uh, of canola when we had talks with China. Then we brought all these survey data into the table. And so, Saskatchewan has never ever had this disease. But if we didn't have those data, we couldn't do uh, more. We couldn't do actually a good defense of our producers. So, and again, if we don't have permission, we can't get uh, to the lands. This is the direction that we get from uh, senior leadership. So uh, we encourage people to uh, give us access to land and for all the provincial disease and insect uh, pest surveys uh, across the province. So moving to uh, OECD diseases and updates. Uh, of course, the, uh, the talk has a very heavy focus on canola. And perhaps if I wanted to talk about mustard, I needed to repeat what I explained already about canola because this is the same pattern. Uh, but flax is a little bit different, even though that's not brown here. So I have a couple of slides at the end on flax. But the, the talk has a really heavy focus on canola. Again, last growing season, we had three different uh, canola surveys done across the province. So we looked at uh, almost 205 fields for general canola disease survey, which was usually done in August, early September. We look at every disease during this survey. Uh, so uh, we go to the fields, and as Megan explained, we look at the prevalence, incidence, and severity of diseases. I will look at every disease that we can think of. But we have two other surveys that they are specific. Everyone's hearing me at the back? Okay. Oh, great. So we also had two specific surveys. One was verticillium, a strike a specific survey, a new concerning disease for the province. Uh, last growing season, we looked at 25 fields. Uh, but we, I will share what is the plan for 2023 later on. And of course, we have perhaps across the Canada, we have the most comprehensive uh, monitoring program for for global. So we look at more than 520 pills across the province for global. So starting with general canola disease survey, again, we look at every disease. As Megan said, we look at the prevalence, which is number of crops with disease. We look at incidence, which is the number of plants in each crop with disease. 
And for some diseases, we look at severity, which is the proportion of the plant with disease. And again, 100% permission based. This uh, survey has always been 100% permission based, but now every survey has permission based. This permission based. So again, as I said, we start sclerotinia stem rot in canola, and again, ter there's a terminology there. Uh, the name of the disease is sclerotinia stem rot. The name of the pathogen is sclerotinia sclerotiorum, and the name of the fungal body, which overwinters and starts the disease again at the new season, is sclerotia. So sclerotinia stem rot, sclerotinia sclerotiorum, and sclerotia. And these are the sclerotia. So it's a soil borne disease. This sclerotia can remain in the soil for three to five years so easily. And then, if the situation is good around June, like if you have 10 days of uh, uh, soil capacity for moisture, uh, then they germinate and they produce these mushroom, mushroom like structures that they are the size of uh, dime. So, if it's a big, it is not, this is not real mushroom, it's not sclerotinia. But if you just walk through the field, you see something at the size of a dime, like a mushroom, especially if it's attached to something hard, like hard uh, from the body, one to two centimeters, it is perhaps you are looking at sclerotinia. So it's a monocycle disease. So this sclerotia in soil in June germinate, if the moisture is there, if uh, the moisture uh, is at, at or near uh, soil capacity, then they germinate, they produce this uh, mushroom-like structure I explained, and uh, this is apothecia, so it produces very many aspospores, which is the sexual spores of the fungus, and they, they, they are wind But when it comes to canola, they have to fall under petals. So if they don't fall on the petals and they don't, they just fall directly on the leaf or the stem, they can they die. So they need to fall on petals and then they grow. So petals give them enough resources, so they grow, they become strong, they produce a little bit of mycelial mat, and then they fall on the leaves, and especially on the corner of the stems and the leaf. So and then they get to the stem. But this is only one cycle, so it is not like a, this is not a polycycle disease that just multiply during the growing season. No, it's a one cycle. So then they get to the stem, and first of all, they uh, produce some bleached lesion, and then this bleached lesion grow. And at the end of the growing season, the whole stem is bleached and it starts to shatter and shred. And if you open it, you will see those big black part bodies of the fungus, which is called the sclerotia. And they are big. You don't need the magnifier to see them. They are one to two centimeters, almost 0 0.8 of an inch. And sometimes some pathologists call them a, like rat droppings size, because they don't want to say mouse dropping, because they are bigger. <laughs> This is a bit disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is uh, the two extreme uh, side of the disease. This is actually when the disease starts. You should be very careful when you see the toes are falling on the leaf and stick to the leaf. This is the time the disease starts. Many people, when we think of sclerotinia stem rot, they think of the stem. But the sclerotinia stem rot starts with leaf. leaf just leave lesion and then it finds its own way to the stem. And this is the end of the growing season, uh, especially if lodging happens, and you will see fluffy fungus over uh, the stems. And if, if bleaching is just extensive, you can even open the stem and check for sclerosia within the stem. So uh, different signs and symptoms of disease on different parts of the plants, pot in infection can happen. So if you see a fluffy white fungus on the pot, especially if it is moist, it can be sclerotinia. But if it is not white, it is not sclerotinia. If it is uh, something that is linked or associated with the damage, like there is insect damage and there is a fungus on it, perhaps it is not sclerotinia. So sclerotinia should be fluffy, white, 
as sometimes given with sclerotia on the palm. Uh, later on, small lesions, and you shouldn't see any dot-like structures or anything on the uh, lesion. The lesion should be plain. Just a plain bleach lesion with darker margins. That's it. If you see dots on it, it is not sclerotinia. And later on, of course, this uh, just expands, and at the end of the season, it starts to shred and shatter, and you can see this uh, sclerotia but So more pictures for you. One is just the uh, pots, and one is uh, the bleached lesions in the most condition. You, so you can see fluffy fungus growing on top of the lesion. So uh, again, another quite severe case of uh, sclerotinia, showing the stems are bleached. And if we open them at this stage, the likelihood that you will see sclerosia is very, very high. So when we are in the field, we also check for severity. Uh, the severity is from uh, 0 to 5 severity scale. Of course, 0 is none. 1 is uh, when the uh, fungus is only on pots. And 2 is if the fungus or the, the lesions are in different combination of branches or on main stem, but in a way that we estimate 25% of the plants' ability to uh, seed and to fling those seeds are impacted, we give it two. If we believe that half of the plant ability to seed and fling those seeds are impacted, we give it three, 75% four. And if the lesion is really in the base of the stem that the whole plant is impacted, we give it five. So uh, one to five scale. So last growing season, uh, 56% of the uh, crops across Saskatchewan have sclerotinia. Uh, incidence was 6% on average. And if we just, some people are interested to know separately what would be the incidence if we just only look at the infected fields. So it is 11%. But overall 6% if you include any field. But if you include only infected fields, 11%. And on that scale of uh, 0 to 5 that I showed you, the severity was 0 0.18 or and 0 0.32 in infected field. So quite low uh, severity. Again, uh, there is no significant uh, or there is no pattern of difference when it comes to canola. There is no pattern of difference if you are practicing under irrigation or not under irrigation. So when things come to beans, uh, you will see more differences. When you talk in wheat, for example, about rusts, you will see differences. But when you talk about canola, actually you expect the most uh, significant difference should come to sclerotinia because sclerotinia is very heavily dependent on moisture. But the research showed that there is, uh, that is not necessarily true. Actually, it's a couple of plots that some my uh, former boss Kelly Terkington had here in Outlook had quite a new amount of sclerotinia in the past. So there's, because uh, sometimes things are dry, you just uh, start ir irrigating, and the impact is very, very short term. As far as the boom passes, the marker envi environment quickly comes back to normal. So uh, this is the case for canola. For uh, more viney uh, plants, like bean, that's different. For bacterial diseases, that's different. And uh, for rust and wheat, it's different. But when you look at canola diseases, you cannot find any significant difference when it comes to uh, irrigation practices, unless someone just irrigate over and over. That's different. <coughs> Which doesn't happen here, because everyone goes to science-based practices. And sure. <laughs> So let's go to regional break. Okay, I, yeah, I moved uh, ahead of myself, so you can hear. And then I wanted to show you the regional breakdown of the disease. As you see, this disease overall is very heavily dependent on moisture. So the regional breakdown is very well aligned with the weather pattern. So you will see more diseases like in Northeast in terms of prevalence and incidence in East Central. 
and the lowest amount of disease we are seeing in southwest and west central. So very well aligned with the moisture pattern we had last growing season. And this disease again is very, very hard to predict. So I can't tell you how much sclerotinia still what you will see next growing season because it heavily depends on what type of environment and moisture you will get there in during the growing season, especially in June and July. So very hard to predict, and you will see when we get to Black Lake, I will, I will predict what happens and that happens. And it was the case, because this is the nature of the pathogen, which doesn't care actually about moisture or not. So uh, the, historical, uh, the historical graph we have in terms of incidence of sclerotinia for Saskatchewan uh, dated back to 1999. So we had 6% of incidence this past growing season. 2021 was a good dry year. So we had the lowest uh, in during years, rather than this very period year of uh, very period of time, very dry period of time of Saskatchewan, 2001 to 2003, which uh, almost no scarcity are recorded here. Uh, but uh, during my time, 2021, this happened that we got a record low in recent years of 2%. So what we got in 2022 was almost three times more than what we got in 2021. So it's still 6%. Like in 2006, as Bursani explained, it was a very wet year. So it has the record high of sclerotinia, 24%. But again, 2017, it was a very dry year. So it declined so rapidly. So it moves up and down with moisture. So we don't know what happens in June, June and July. So I can't tell you how much sclerotinia we will get. Okay, moving to another very important disease, black leg, still comes to uh, trade discussion. Still some importers are very sensitive because they don't have leptospheric maculas yet, so they don't want it. Uh, this disease, black leg, has two pathogens associated with it, but one is Leptospheria Viglobosa, which is a very weak pathogen. Usually I don't care about it because it only can cause small superficial uh, lesions on this step, and that's it. The one that we are very scared of always is Leptospheria maculans, very virulent, and some uh, of the destination for cannula uh, products, or cannula seeds, uh, they still have no record of this species, so they don't want it, and it brings it to terrain discussion once in a while. So it's a very virulent species, and it affects definitely both seed yield and quality. This is the life cycle, it's a polycyclic, polycyclic disease, so it's not like a sclerotinia, that's only one cycle, it's a polycyclic disease, and I will show you good pictures of uh, the disease on, on the stubble. So if uh, after harvest, and of course before snow, or now when snow melts, but before seeding, you walk throughout the field and look at the stubble, and if you see on the cannula stubble, you will see dotted, big dotted structures. Perhaps you are looking at, I, I, I'm gonna show you good pictures, but perhaps you are looking at black lip. And of course these, uh, yeah, quite a long period of time, May, August, these are capable of uh, producing ascospores, which is the sexual spores that can attack seedlings, cotyledons, and young leaves. And again, black leg, many of us think of stem right away, but again, it starts with the leaf leech, and then the pathogen finds its way to the stem. Again, it's a polycyclic disease, so these ascospores attack seedlings, cotyledons, young leaves, especially uh, up to six leaf stage, and then they cause uh, dirty white lesions on the leaf, which when the lesion matures, uh, it has lots of dot on it, and each dot is one pycnidium, which is the asexual fruiting body of the pathogen. So sexual fruiting body of the pathogen are these sodotesia, and uh, asexual fruiting body of the pathogen on the leaves are pycnidia, which has very many pycnidiospores in it, and then they can, if 
effect is under irrigation of this uh, storm and rain. Can, they can splash to new leaves and, and foliage parts of the plant. So it depends on the type of weather and environment. The disease can multiply a multiple, yeah, multiply couple of times, or depends on the weather perhaps multiple times. Uh, and this is the reason this disease is a uh, multi-cyclic or polycyclic disease. And then when we get the disease in the sibling, the fungus can find its way toward the stem, goes down, and if the infection happens very early, so you will get a very big uh, base of the stem canker. And if uh, the situation is really bad, then perhaps lodging, even lodging can happen. It's rare, but I saw it last year. I'm sure it came to the story. And there was a risk here. <laughs> yeah, because it was hail, because this, this is a polycyclic disease. So hail is associated with it. So sometimes you see severe cases that they are interaction of hail and black lead. And then it gets to some issues. Yeah. Okay, so this disease is not like sclerotinia. It is among the least impacted diseases by moisture. So even in a dry year, you will get lots, lots of black leg. This is the reason I am telling you that you will get black leg next growing season, especially if your field has a history of black leg. Of course, we are in a good shape in terms of management because of the very good breeding which was done to this disease. And SAS canola also starting last year at the program of uh, uh, testing for black leg rates in, in field, which is free to producers. Uh, producers just send samples to Discovery Seed Lab. SAS Canola covers the cost. Discovery Seed Lab will give you the pathogen race profile, and based on that, you can choose the cultivar for the next time you plan to grow canola, and you will get a right resistance. If you have a black leg, is easy in your field, and if you want to choose your cultivar based on black leg resistance. Mm -hmm. So this is what I explained uh, about the stubble. So these are subutisia on the stubble that they cover winter. You can find them after harvest, before the first snow, or uh, now when the snow melts before seeding. Uh, lesions on the seedlings and cotyledons. Again, brownish gray lesions on cotyledons and leaves uh, with full of dotted like structures or pepper like structures on them, uh, each called the pycnidia. Yeah, more photos for uh, the lesions caused by black leg. Again, uh, dirty white, brownish gray lesions on cotyledons and leaves. And if I want to scot for this, I will go when I am in the uh, period of three to six uh, leaf stage. So uh, side by side comparison of leaf lesions of uh, uh, black leg versus sclerotinia. Again, perhaps because we explained sclerotinia first, we go to sclerotinia. The timing is very limited because you need infected petals fallen on the leaf and stick to the leaf. So most of the time when we have a sclerotinia leaf lesion, there is a petal to stick to it. Because the petal has the infection first and passed it to the to the to the leaf. And there's nothing there. There's no structure, there's no pythium, there is no pepper like structure, nothing. It's just a water soaked lesion and usually a petal is stick to it. And it happens uh, at early flowering most of the time. However, for black leg, it can happen anytime during the growing season. And if the lesion is mature, you will see these dotted uh, or pepper like structures on them, which are picking So, side by side, the uh, comparison of leaf lesions black leg versus sclerotin. When it comes to stems, uh, black leg can cause the stem, black leg can cause lesions anywhere on the stem. Of course, the worst of ones in terms of yield loss is if it is a uh, stem uh, base of canker. If it is really severe, it ends to the lodging of the plants. 
And most of the time, you will see between here, even on the uh, other side of the stem. And of course, if you get your clippers and cut the plants at the sole line and look at it, you will see blackening of the cross stem. So side by side, the sclerotinia versus black leg. Uh, of course, sclerotinia causes those bleached lesion. No structure on the lesion. A stem shatters and shreds. It doesn't happen in black leg, but it happens in red ceiling. You get red ceiling blade. And if you open it, and it is really advanced, you will see big uh, sclerosis of the fungus. So on, the, on that table, I brought for you to look sclerotinia stem rod, black lid, and cilium. So you can, after my talk, you can take a look. However, for black lid, you don't have the shredding and shattering of the stem. We have lesions that uh, pick me beyond them. So quite distinct, not very hard to differentiate uh, sclerotinia stem rod versus black lid. Looking at the uh, uh, cross section, of course, you get your clipper, you cut a couple of uh, your plants at the sole line, you look at the cross section, and I prepare, uh, like intentionally, I put weak, weak cases. So, even on weak cases of black leg, you see blackening of the uh, cross section, and usually it is in the form of a wedge. So, it's a wedge and it's black. And it's a hard one actually, so I put a hard one for you first. And of course you don't look at one aspect, you only don't look at the cross section. Of course when you look at the cross section you also can look at if you have a base of stem canker here. And you will see them. In really good varieties you don't see a stem canker any longer. So you can count on black and the cross section more. But it still it's not common to find them. But it's not hard always. Sometimes very clear that's black, but uh, black wedge is really solid black. Can't be anything else. But black that can also cause odd issue, odd uh, symptoms, like a star-like pattern, halfway of the stem or throughout the stem, like a black star. Finding black leg and root maggot on the same plant is not uncommon at all. Again, when we are in the field, we have the severity, uh, severity, this is severity scale of 0 to 5 for black leg as well. No, the, yeah, of course, it is based on the cross section, so we get our clippers, cut the plants at the sole line, look at it. If it is absolutely healthy, 0. If it is 25% uh, of the cross section is black, we give it 1, 52, 75% tree, if it's all black, but the plant is healthy, so if it's all black, the plant is still healthy, there is no constriction, there is no death, we do it four. If it's all black, the plant is dead, we do it five. And each severity scale is one jump off in terms of yield loss. But we don't have time to get to that. So last growing season, 73% of the crops had black leg, it's very high number. Uh, incidence was 11% on average, 15% for infected fields, very high incidence. But given the very good resistance done, we got quite very low severity. So the severity is 0 0.16 on that scale of 0 to 5. So very uh, many crops with black leg, high incidence, very low severity. Uh, again, this disease doesn't uh, follow uh, moisture pattern most of the time. So if you look at this, uh, this is the third year in a row that Northeast has the lowest amount of black leg. And this year we had uh, more black leg in East Central in terms of prevalence and in, in terms of incidence in Northwest and Southeast. Black leg incidence historically uh, uh, over time back to 2012. So between 2013 and 2020, there was always an increase in the amount of black leg. In 2021, Saskatchewan actually was the only province who reported lower amount of disease. Manitoba reported the same amount of disease. Alberta reported even more. So there is no pattern to 
link it to more sphere. And then this year, again, we got back to uh, almost 11% incidence of black lead. And then verticillium. So verticillium is nowadays a daily conversation in my office, either with the producer or with our uh, senior leadership or agrologists. Everyone is concerned uh, about that because I think it's coming from the east. Um, so uh, I can say this is quite new. There are a lot of unknowns. There are more unknowns definitely than nouns. Um, in 2014, it was the first crime ever in Canada. It's a very well established disease in Europe, but we're not talking about Europe. We're talking about Canada. In Canada, we had no history till 2014. Manitoba funded first. 2015, CFIA did a soil survey and funded DNA almost everywhere, even in British Columbia. In British Columbia, we don't have much canola. In Ontario, we don't have either much canola. But the DNA was there. But we didn't confirm the package in Saskatchewan uh, until last year. So last year was the very first time that we found uh, Red Sea on Strike with visible signs and uh, clear, uh, uh, with clear disease symptoms and visible pathogen sign in the eastern side of the province. Uh, we sent those samples to the University of Manitoba for confirmation and they came back as yes, it is uh, verticillium and not only it's verticillium, but they had some bad news for us. We, all, we, we had both species of verticillium dahi, which is look like verticillium in potato and alfalfa and other stuff, and verticillium rangisporium, which is specific to brassica, brassica family. Another bad news was even though that Manitoba has this disease in like 30 or 40 percent of their crops, they always reported only one lineage of Verticillium langiosporium, which is lineage A1D1. But in our samples, all the two lineages of Verticillium langiosporium were from last year. So A1D1, A1D2, A1D3. And still, I don't know what would be the impact on trades in future or how much it complicates already or we just started breeding programs, but we already informed the uh, breeding companies and researchers of these findings. Again, we're still longisporium, the more valent uh, pathogen is very different from any other reticillium. It has two sets of chromosomes, so it's a diploid. Any other reticillium is just halfway. So reticillium stripe is like blood root, it's soil borne disease. Uh, we don't it's still research it. Research didn't start till 2019, and usually they were funded from 2019 to 2024. So perhaps we won't have solid information till perhaps later in 2024. Uh, so there are lots of unknown, most of the things people uh, use to talk about where the civilian comes is still from European literature, including yield loss that tell people 10 to 15% in most cases, and up to 50% get a severe case, all come from European literature. I still, we are waiting perhaps for another year or two to hear more from researchers across uh, prayers. So, for verticillium, uh, there are structures called microsclerotia, again, one cycle. So, sclerotia, when, uh, when, when it comes to the canola root exudates, it germinates, it attacks the stem. It goes to the xylem, it blocks the xylem, and then it manifests itself as a stripes. And this is the name called why the name called it slum stripe, because you will see a stripe up on one side of the plant. So and it happens close to the harvest or even after harvest. Uh, in the past some literature were misleading because we told it comes too late to have any impact on yield, but now we know we see it. Too late. Now the pathogen comes too late. Perhaps pathogen even comes before flowering. But it takes time for it to get to the xylem. It already starts contributing to yield loss. Uh, but we don't see it. There's no symptom whatsoever until later, closer to the harvest time, that you first you will see a stripes on one side of the plant. And then after harvest, actually, you will see the real pathogen size. 
So these are the stripes that I was talking. So vertical yellow or brown stripes on one side of the plant, closer to the harvest time is an indication of uh, um, the disease. At least in a sense, it's stunting, but it is not an indication because any other uh, biotic or abiotic cause uh, can also produce or generate similar symptoms. But vertical yellow stripes up on one side of the plant, perhaps you are looking at verticillium. The other disease that can cause that is zoning leaf, but it's very well taken care of by the readers already, so it should be ready. So if these days someone comes and says closer to the harvest time, I have seen a stripe on one side of the plants, and plants are still uh, in good stand, if there is no lodging, perhaps they are looking at the similar stripe. You said this, uh, this is a study done in, uh, at the University of Manitoba to see if this stunting happens, and of course the stunting happened. So um, they did it in greenhouse, they inoculated them with Vexillium dangosporium, and uh, stunting happens. The plants with Vexillium are much shorter. Again, Justin Cornelson, uh, uh, an agrologist in Manitoba, was the, uh, among the very first people to try to raise awareness about this disease. And I still will see many pictures we use this from Justin. And it is one of uh, the plants from Manitoba closer to the uh, harvest time and you see stripes on one side of the stem and dead stem branches again most of the time on the one side of the plant there is only one symptom which is specific to verticillium and no other disease has this and it is unfortunately happens after harvest epidermis gets peeled back and you will see lots of very, very tiny black structures called microsclerotia. So on the uh, table, uh, on the back, I put some of these good magnifiers. You can't see them if you don't have a good magnifier. And, uh, and the plants with verticillium from Saskatchewan and Riker nuts, so they cannot escape. So you can have these, of course, different it's like microscope, so this moves, not this one. So you will take this in front of your eyes and you bring this close. And all of a sudden it becomes like a microscope. And I am now seeing like a bond is perhaps, perhaps we build use of microscope. So you can check that. And if you want to see what's the difference between this and blackly, I also brought blackly. The community of black and they are much larger, but it's still doing the microscope. And the screws. The scrutiny is very different because scrotia are one to two centimeters. You even don't need anything to, to find it. So move on, uh, perhaps to more pictures at this time. There are more. This is one of the first fields found in uh, in Saint Rose in Manitoba in 2016 after harvest. Lots of green back happening at that time, and you can see uh, the use of those tiny structures called microscrotia. So side by side, uh, and this is another thing some agrologists at the very first uh, set of calls, they told producers are talking about sclerotinia, because producers were talking about shredding and shattering, which are happening in both diseases. But if you open a stem with a scler sclerotinia stem rod, you will see big sclerotia. But for verticillium, you, you need to have a very good magnifier find those tiny uh, microscopes. So another thing is if you use your clippers and cut the plants at the soil line, verticillium also has some discoloration, but it is very even, grayish, mild, and peppered out through the cross section. It's not like black and ridges. It's not solid black. And of course, you look at of course the region. So you never look at only one thing; you look at everything. So we have the black like here, but the regions are here. We have verticillium here. I will check for microsclerotia as well. Moving on, side by side, this is a very good picture again from Justin. Side by side, verticillium stripe versus black leg. 
and the uh, activity of blanket is much larger than microscopic of red cilium. And again, cross sections of blacklit are different than this quite even grayish very through pattern for sclerosis. It is not uncommon to find both disease on one piece of the stem. So this piece of the stem, again another picture from Justin, has both diseases, black leg and red seal. Another thing is pycnidia of black leg are on plant. There is nothing we need to be done to, for us to be able to see them. However, for macroscopia, this clean back of the feeder needs to happen for you to be able to see this macroscopia underneath the feeder. So I know there are different. Physiarium, physiarium width is the most similar because it has stripes, but I don't care much because it should be rare. And if it's if we see it very early before harvest, only a lab can come there. So our lab in Regina, the provincial crop protection lab, can do that. And there are other labs like Discovery Seed Lab, they can also confirm it's for fusarium or if it's uh, red cilium. However, after harvest, it is easy because only red cilium has that character of the epidermis being peeled back and revealing lots of natural solution, which is this one. Yeah, if you send it to, to the lab, again, similar to the picture Musahib showed you, they try to culture it, and uh, this is the fungus. Last time we did it in, at the University of Manitoba, we had six samples from Saskatchewan, 14 from Manitoba, three from Ontario. All Ontario uh, samples were with Redstone Dabney, <coughs> Manitoba, all of them were Redstone, not just Sporium, but all of them were one lineage, a one one and those six samples from Saskatchewan tend to be, turned out to be very interesting. Because three came as red cilium here, three came as red cilium longisporium. Each of the three red cilium longisporium were different lineage. So it shows that we have a very high diversity of this pathogen on the, at least now on the east side of the province. Again, not only red cilium longisporium, has double the chromosomes, even if its spores are twice bigger than the cilium daphne. But you can see them only in the lab. And this is the PCR we are doing to differentiate red cilium daphne versus red cilium longisporium. And then this one is the PCR we do to differentiate the lineages A1B1, A1B2, and A1B3. And at this time, Saskatchewan works very closely with the University of Manitoba. The reason is uh, in more applied aspects, they are now the leading uh, research group. So, especially myself, I'm working very closely with those researchers in, uh, in Manitoba. So again, there was no confirmation of this disease before 2021. A Carter Crew, our IPM specialist, uh, found for suspicious lab for uh, for suspicious samples in 2021. Uh, we sent them to Manitoba. They they come they came back as red cilium here and red, red, red cilium longisporium, but without visible signs of the pathogen. The first uh, confirmed samples visible sign of the pathogen came from a farmer. They were harvesting. They saw something different. They got out of the combine, checked it, and the producer was also an agrologist. So all, all is at the at the scene. Actually, she told it is red cilium. But send this, send that to us. I confirmed that yes, it's red cilium in in the lab with microscopy. Send them to University of Manitoba, and they confirm yes. But the two lineages are different from the one you sent like a month ago, which is not a very good uh, update for breeding companies because they should think of uh, those. These samples are actually those samples the producers uh, sent me. This is under magnifier, and these are exactly the same samples on the back of the room. So the question is, is red cilium strike a rare disease in Saskatchewan? Uh, long answer short, perhaps not. Um, uh, but uh, we will know in 2022. Uh, so during just normal general Canada disease survey, just last growing season, 
we found zero number of verticillium during the girls' stage of 5.2 normal survey time. <coughs> okay, we told the prairies is flat. How many Toba can have 40% of their crops with verticillium? And of course, pathogens do not respect borders. So we targeted 25 fields with close proximity to Manitoba fields, and a group of us went to those fields after harvest to see what's going on. And we put these, uh, these sheets for our producers to fill out what, what, everything they see. I don't go through details because of time. We ask them to follow the general W uh, shape pattern of uh, classes, classic surveys, like general Canada survey. We found a patch on the east side of the province. Our surveyors called it uh, Canada Diseases Classroom because there was verticillium stripe and all other similar diseases there, sclerotinia, black lip, and gray stem. So we trained them uh, there and then we moved on to different uh, fields, and each color is one of our surveyors, and perfect was myself. Went to five minutes. What's only five minutes I have? Okay. So, so we just move on very quickly, very quickly. So, um, yeah, again, surprising. Six of those fields got back as very senior positive, so they're perhaps it's not fair anymore uh, but we put this information it's very important for people we didn't find any during summer we found a lot after harvest counterparts in manitoba found a lot counterparts in orbit found a little if you have more questions there, there are multiple layers there that we're just passing hopefully this doesn't happen in saskatchewan this is from manitoba uh, so let's see i'm just building up in manitoba hopefully that in the case in saskatchewan we'll see 2023, we are gonna do an after harvest verticillium specific survey on top of general Canada disease survey, and we include all regions that they grow Canada in province. So we produce lots of good information by the end of this year, and even uh, industry readers and researchers are looking at us to see what we find. So these are four big diseases. Unfortunately, there are four, not four. In the past, we've, we've been talking about three big diseases of canola, clobrid, uh, with clobrid, stem, uh, sclerotinia, and black leg. No, there are four different cilium. So compared to the minor diseases, asteriodos, we found in 26% of, uh, of the crops, including what typical case in, in Outlook, in Bofan. And half, half of the fields we survey have alternaria. Uh, brown garden in root rot, we didn't find any during the survey, but producers sent us some. Uh, root rot, we only found in northeast and southeast, nowhere else. This is fast, yeah. <laughs> so, gray, yeah, there's no time. Gray stem, <laughs> gray stem looks like black leg, but it's very superficial. If you scratch it, the tissue beneath it is very healthy. If you get your clippers, cut it, everything is healthy. So, that's gray stem. Absolutely no relationship with yield. Two producers called me and they said they are harvesting and there is a white cloud around them, sitting on them and on heather and on, on, on combines. Nothing to be worried about. That's father yield. It comes too late to have any impact on yield. And cloud the uh, last but not the least. We all know cloud root is those cause. And again, uh, this is kind of uh, rotten appearance cloud root after, after harvest or in the center of the patch, uh, for, for that. <laughs> so again, Saskatchewan has the most comprehensive global monitoring program, very successful, had multi it has multiple components. Uh, I only give you one difference uh, that happened in 2022, is now root, even though it's a regulated pest, it's a declared pest, the permission now moved to be 100%. The survey moved to be 100% permission based. So this year, we don't do cooperative survey under the authority of the Pest Control Act. We do it like any other survey, like survey, survey, general cannabis survey. 
you ask for permission. If we get permission, we go. In. No, we don't. Also, we change all the communication. Any finding through soil, now only we communicate it with the producer. That's it. The producer gave us the permission, and the finding is without a visible goal. It's only through DNA. We just tell the producer, you have to do something. And that's it. Our role is done. Then we leave it to producer to lead the management if there is no goal at all. So you will see some trends there, and perhaps the trends will get sharper uh, during uh, perhaps in the following years. So, uh, more than 520 fields below that. Good news is we only found two fields with visible symptoms and only four cases of DNA of the pathogen. So it's only six, per six <coughs> fields out of 521, which is really good. At the same time, our counterparts in, in Alberta found 73 new fields. 72 new fields with visible goals. And their number moved to 5,300 fields with visible goals. So the risk of the disease is still very high because we always will look at the numbers in Alberta and we are waiting to this is very obvious. So, uh, so the disease risk is high, but, uh, but we are good in Saskatchewan for now. We have only 82 fields in total in the history of the uh, group finding in Saskatchewan with visible symptoms. This is a small table is the history of Clark in Saskatchewan. This year we got to 82 fields with visible symptoms, 42 with DNA of the pathogen without visible symptoms. Again, all we of this year got 5,300. So uh, we are in good shape, but we shouldn't underestimate this. Each one of these is a big molecular source, one is in Pathotyping we done and uh, Still, we don't have a pathotype able to overcome disease resistance, but we always recommend a cultivar with two genes, not one gene. No, that's available. Good resources for clot, for clot information. Flax disease, I just touch. So, so uh, we don't have flax disease, unfortunately, this upcoming uh, year. There are transitions. SAS flax is going to be part of SAS. Canola, so. There's a pause there, but uh, past the early season, we did a uh, survey and the same University of Saskatchewan led survey supported by SAS flags. Uh, perhaps uh, we just look at PASMO, is it still the most important disease? We communicated this with readers, they are working to uh, develop some resistance against uh, PASMO. And again, PASMO is built known by those alternative bands on the stem. Some more pictures of those alternative bands, which is specific to Paxman flags. So the area of the regions are healthy. And I guess, uh, don't forget about this. <laughs> and then we get to this, and uh, yeah, so I am not bad. I told you, so it takes one hour, and it took one hour. So if you have any questions uh, now or in future, just please uh, feel free to contact me. Again, the. The work I presented is a work of a very, very large team, including ministry of staff, SARM uh, plant health officers, SCIC, uh, SAS Canova supporting, and uh, two labs, the uh, ESL, Discovery Seed Lab, and Crop Protection Lab are doing the uh, experiments. So there are very many people involved to have this, uh, this information. This is the reason we ask, and it really gives us a strength when we go to uh, tables, especially when it comes to trade. Again, I just wanted to kind of echo that uh, this uh, scan goes uh, Q and R, and uh, if you haven't done so already, give us access to, to the lab to continue this work. Thank you very much.